Hello everyone and welcome to another MedScience Academy lecture. This video will try and explain the various medical aspects of amitrostenosis, including some of its causes, symptoms and a few ways we can treat such an affliction. Before we dive deep into today's topic, we wanted to remind you to subscribe to stay notified about our upcoming cardiology lectures. Before we start to understand how a mitral stenosis affects patients, we need to identify the specific causes of this cardiovascular pathology. Globally, the most common cause of mitral stenosis is rheumatic fever, the condition which develops when strep throat or scarlet fever isn't properly treated. It causes significant inflammation of the mitral leaflets and the resulting fibrosis causes a reduction of the mitral opening. Next up, calcific degeneration of the mitral valve is seen in the elderly and is the most common cause of mitral stenosis in North America. Basically, the valve leaflets become calcified and this impairs their opening mechanics during the cardiac cycle. Finally, some autoimmune diseases such as lupus or rheumatoid arthritis alongside the rare possibility of a congenital stenosis are also causes of mitral stenosis. A mention needs to be made here. Some pathologies like bacterial endocarditis with large vegetations on the valve or left atrial myxomas, a type of cardiac tumors, can cause a deficient flow through the mitral valve and can thus mimic a mitral stenosis. Now, getting to the technical part. In terms of pathophysiology, the most important aspect we need to understand is that the narrow mitral valve will lead to an impaired emptying of the left atrium which will cause a series of consequences. If you wish to better understand the mechanics of valvular disease, you can check out our video right here. Like we mentioned, this impaired emptying of the left atrium will cause multiple consequences. Because a larger amount of blood will be stuck trying to get out of the left atrium, that will cause increased left atrial pressures and the eventual enlargement of this chamber. Also, because less blood gets through the narrow valve, there will be an impaired filling of the left ventricle. What we will do next is take each of these pathophysiological consequences and discuss their implications on the patient. First, because all that blood in the left atrium can't be mobilized into the systemic circulation, it will start to accumulate backwards and lead to an increased pressure in the pulmonary veins. This pressure that starts to build up will eventually reach the small vessels and capillaries of the pulmonary circulation leading to a significant increase in hydrostatic pressure. Is this a reason for concern? It should be. All that extra blood will start to leak out into the alveoli causing pulmonary edema. Also, it will lead to the development of pulmonary hypertension, making it harder for the right heart to pump blood efficiently. These increased vascular pressures will force the right ventricle to develop higher pumping forces and eventually reactive hypertrophy to keep up with the pathological changes. Secondly, the left atrial enlargement that develops because of the microstenosis will lead to the compression of surrounding structures. Considering the left atrium is the most posterior chamber of the heart, the anatomical components directly affected will be the esophagus and the left recurrent laryngeal nerve, leading to some of the symptoms associated with this valvular disease. Here we have a visual representation of the anatomical environment of the heart. We can observe the left vagus nerve descending in proximity to the aorta, the left recurrent laryngeal nerve which encircles the aortic arch inferiorly to ascend towards the larynx, and finally the esophagus. Now we have an approximation of the heart's position and we can clearly deduce that if the left atrium gets larger than, than it should be, the esophagus and the left recurrent laryngeal nerve will get compressed, which will lead to their functional impairment. Aside from the compressions it causes, the left atrial enlargement will also lead to the stretching of the atrial conduction fibers, leading to increased atrial muscle conduction times and a reduction in atrial muscle refractory period. Basically, impulses will travel slower in the atrium and the fibers will depolarize more easily, all of these causing re-entrance circuits, a major cause for arrhythmias. One such arrhythmia, caused by multiple re-entrance circuits in the atria, is atrial fibrillation. The chaotic impulses generated make the atria lose their ability to contract efficiently, which translates as a loss of atrial kick, basically the absence of atrial contraction. Because the blood is no longer ejected properly from the atrium, 
it will pull and lead to stasis, it will cause an impaired filling of the left ventricle and an impaired emptying of the left atrium, leading to further atrial enlargement and an augmentation of its effects. To summarize, atrial fibrillation has some of the same consequences as mitral stenosis, which only aggravates the patient's state. Finally, the effects mitral stenosis has on the left ventricle. Because the left ventricle doesn't get filled with enough blood during diastole, the end diastolic volume will decrease, leading to a reduction in stroke volume and cardiac output. Moving on from pathophysiology, we are going to start and discuss the signs and symptoms of mitral stenosis and what causes them. Dyspnea is caused by the pulmonary edema, making it harder for the patient to breathe. In early stages, symptoms of pulmonary edema are often only present under circumstances that require high cardiac output, such as fever, exercise, pregnancy, or emotional stress. Dysphagia appears because of the esophagus that is compressed by the left atrium. Palpitations appear due to the atrial fibrillation. Hoarseness, which is rare, is caused by the compression of the left recurrent laryngeal nerve. Finally, although less common, hemoptysis can develop as a result of ruptured small vessels due to the increased pulmonary vascular pressure. In terms of clinical signs, we can hear a definitive change in the first cardiac sound, depending on the stage of the stenosis. As a result, in early stages of mitral stenosis, there is a high-intensity S1 caused by thick, stiff leaflets, which are still mobile. In late, severe stages, the thickening and calcification are too advanced and the mitral leaflets become rigid and lose their mobility, resulting in a low-intensity S1. Furthermore, there is a mid-diastolic rumble caused by the passive turbulent flow of blood through the valve during ventricular diastole. Afterwards, atrial contraction occurs pushing more blood in the ventricle through the narrow valve which results in a presystolic accentuation of the rumble described. Important to note is that this presystolic accentuation disappears in case of atrial fibrillation since atrial contraction is not what it used to be. Also, after the second heart sound, which signals the beginning of the ventricular diastole, we can hear an opening snap caused by the forceful opening of the valve whose leaflets can't open all the way and stop during their normal opening movement. Important to mention is that the time between S2 and this opening snap has important staging significance. The shorter the time between the beginning of the diastole, marked by the S2, and the opening snap, the more severe the stenosis is. Why is that? Well, in severe instances of mitral stenosis, the atrial pressures developed become so significant that they will manage to overcome diastolic ventricular pressures sooner and cause the opening snap to occur closer to the S2. We have a diagram later in our presentation that will put all these auscultation findings into perspective. Lastly, a left parasternal lift or impulse can be palpated, signaling right ventricular hypertrophy, a sign the mitral stenosis has affected the pulmonary vessels. Up next, we discuss the complications of mitral stenosis. The extra effort the right ventricle has to make to maintain the high pressures needed to pump adequately in the pulmonary circulation will eventually overwhelm the heart, leading to right-sided heart failure. Also, on the left side, reduced stroke volume and cardiac output increase the risk for congestive heart failure and even cardiogenic shock with tissue hyperperfusion and even death. Like already discussed, AFib is an arrhythmia induced by the left atrial enlargement. Also, because the malformations of the mitral leaflets leave them vulnerable to infection and the formation of vegetations, infective endocarditis is also a possible complication. Finally, the pooling of blood in the left atrium increases the likelihood of thrombus formation and the risk of embolization in the cerebral circulation leading to stroke. For the next section of our lecture, we will present the main diagnostic tools we can use and we begin with cardiac auscultation. For mitral stenosis, we can detect a low-pitch, rumbling, diastolic murmur best heard at the cardiac apex and which intensifies when lying on his or her left side. The S1 is clearly altered, either intensified in early stages or diminished in late stages of mitral stenosis. The opening snap is clearly audible between the S2 and the murmur mentioned. Here we have the diagram we mentioned. 
Unfortunately, we do not have any audio file, but we hope this will help you get a better idea on the bigger picture of these auscultation findings. So, going to the beginning of the diastole, we have the S2 caused by the closure of the sigmoid valves in red, which is closely followed by the opening snap in yellow, produced by the forceful opening of the narrow mitral valve. Afterwards, also in yellow, there is first a mid-diastolic de decrescendo murmur caused by the passive passage of blood in the ventricle, followed by the crescendo presystolic accentuation produced by the atrial contraction. Finally, before the systole begins, we have in red the S1 signaling the closure of the atrial ventricular valves. Next, in terms of chest x-ray, there are different findings depending on the view we are using. In the posterior anterior view, we can observe left atrium enlargement with a prominent left appendage, straining the left cardiac border and pulmonary congestion. In a lateral view, dorsal displacement of the esophagus is noticed because of the large left atrium alongside a likely right ventricular hypertrophy. In this improvised posterior anterior x-ray, we can observe a clear straightening of the left cardiac border. The normal configuration of the heart is indicated by the dashed line. Starting from the top, we can observe the silhouettes of the aortic arch, the pulmonary trunk, the left atrial appendage and the left ventricle. Switching over to EKG, the most significant changes associated with mitral stenosis are p mitrally atrial fibrillation and right ventricular hypertrophy. For the latter, the Sokolov Leon index can be used. To better understand the concept of P mitrally, let's have a look at the genesis of a normal P wave. The two electrical vectors of the right atrium in blue and left atrium in red are not simultaneous but fuse to form a larger singular P wave, representing an overall positive electrical vector of atrial depolarization. Now, in mitral stenosis, the left atrium presents with more muscular mass which produces larger voltages and requires more time to depolarize. As a result, the left atrial component dominates the right atrium electrically, leading to this longer P wave with the appearance of the letter M. The last of the diagnostic methods, echocardiography, is the most important tool for detecting and assessing valvular abnormalities. In our case, we can observe abnormal valve mobility, subvalvular thickening, leaflet thickening, or calcification depending on the stage of the mitral stenosis. Now, for the final section of this lecture, we are going to talk a bit about the treatment options. Depending on the various clinical factors, especially the severity of the stenosis, we can choose a conservative or an interventional treatment. The conservative option includes medications to help the heart in its attempt to deal with the valvular defect. We can prescribe beta blockers or calcium channel blockers to ensure a slower heart rate and give the left ventricle a chance to fill adequately with blood. We should use antibiotics for endocarditis prophylaxis, anticoagulants to reduce the risk of stroke in patients with AFib, and we can also go with diuretics in case of heart failure. Very important to know, in the case of heart failure, we should only use diuretics because medications like ACE inhibitors or any other afterload reducing drugs will cause peripheral vasodilation and the heart will not be able to adapt its output to the new conditions because of the mitral stenosis, leading to vascular decompensation. A more, a, a more radical approach is the interventional treatment, generally indicated for cases of high-grade and or symptomatic stenosis. First-line treatment is percutaneous balloon commissurotomy of the mitral valve, a commissure being the line where the leaflet margins meet. The best candidates being symptomatic patients with uncomplicated mitral stenosis who present with pliable, mobile, rel relatively thin, minimally calcified mitral leaflets. The short version of it is that the catheter is introduced transvenously all the way to the heart and a balloon is inflated inside the mitral valve, separating the previously fused leaflets. Alternatives are open commissurotomy and surgical valve replacement, either mechanical or biological. This is the end of our presentation. Thank you so, so much for sticking around to the end. We hope you enjoyed our content. If so, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel, Med Science Academy. We really hope this video managed to help you better understand the insights of mitral stenosis and made studying a bit easier. We will see you soon. Have an awesome day.